Good afternoon. And today we have uh, William Mazzola with us, Judge William Mazzola. Mr. Hackey. From the uh, senior judge from the First Judicial District, Court of Common Pleas. It's a pleasure to have you here today, Judge, and thank you for participating. With My us. pleasure. Uh, to start out with, can you tell us a little bit about your background before you came and became a judge? Well, obviously, I was a practicing an attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> the genesis of that, my father was a, an attorney locally, a Temple Law graduate, and I became an attorney, and I practiced privately and with the district attorney's office. I was first admitted to the bar in Maryland, and secondly, I took the bar, I was admitted to the bar in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I worked in the district attorney's office under F. Emmett Fitzpatrick, and I worked in private practice for a firm uh, known as Stack and Gallagher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked in the private sector and as a district attorney uh, for approximately a little over 10 years before right. I ran for judge. Okay. Back right. in 19, uh, November of 81 is when I first ran for judge. All right. Was, was there any particular thing that prompted you to run for the, for the bench? Uh, I wouldn't say not one specific thing jumped out. Uh, at that time, I, besides the, what the usual advantages one would define from taking the bench, mm -hmm. there was personal advantages in the nature of lifestyle. I practiced primarily criminal defense law, mm -hmm. and I anticipated a career in that. Understanding that uh, criminal defense law requires a lot of time-consuming activities <clears throat> over and above what goes on in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. okay. And in order to be economically sound in that type of practice, you go one of two ways. You either charge exorbitantly high fees, yeah. which was not in my bailiwick back then, okay. or you do volume. And volume requires having a lot of cases in the system at the same time. And by definition, uh, a lot of your clients are in custody, at not making bail, right. and there's on crime scene investigations that have to be done. There's, an, <clears throat> there's some investment in cases financially, nothing along the lines of a civil lawyer investing in a civil case. Yeah. Uh, I, on the other side of the coin, I was, had young children. Okay. And I believed I had the temperament. I believed at the time the Bar Association looked at candidates and one of the... Uh, qualifying factors was at least back in those days 10 yeah. years practice of law okay you had that. and I had I had that in and I knew that taking this type of job uh, would allow me to have the uh, routineness of a schedule gotcha as a consequence you know I watched my kids grow up I didn't like a lot of people I know who are in the criminal defense side were not judges defense lawyers yeah they're spending their weekends at prisons or their nights at prisons, so they're getting home at 9 o'clock or at 10 o'clock at night. And some of them handle that better than others. Okay. But I achieved both goals. Good. Yeah, I had a family life where I got to participate in my children's childhood. Right. As well as doing a job I like. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's great. Uh, and I think another judge has told us also that in order to sort of get some order to their yeah. life and and predictable uh, schedule they they decided to one of the reasons they decided to become a judge still stay involved in the criminal law yeah but yeah so that's great um i was wondering if now it's been a little bit of time that since you began to practice law and today and i was wondering over 40 years <laughs> okay <laughs> <And> <laughs> Is that all? And and uh, I was wondering if you noticed any uh, big changes in the practice of law over that time. Yeah, the technical practice of law. Sure, I have. I hearken back that you know I see the lawyers today. Technology has invaded the province yeah. in a way that I never would have anticipated uh, back when I first started. Some of the technology, obviously, I th is a considered improvement mm -hmm. in the maintenance of records, the electronic filing in courts, um, the email and stuff, uh, things along those lines. Right. Some of it's a detriment. 
people I think are, are don't have any perspective or exercise good judgment, not necessarily lawyers, mm -hmm. in the stuff they put on these social networks. Oh, right. And yeah. I've had a couple that. cases where witnesses and or defendants have been, it has come out in trials of things they put on YouTube or mm -hmm. Facebook mm -hmm. and had, had serious effects upon their trials. In the old days, you know, when I scheduled cases, every lawyer would pull out his day timer yeah. or something like that as right. well as the court. Now they don't, they're all, they have, but they're stylus and they're a little electronic device, yeah. which causes me to chuckle because I still use a spiral date calendar. Yeah. And when I go to schedule a date, I can retrieve the information significantly faster than they can. <laughs> I like to see it yeah, written yeah, down myself. Yeah. <laughs> but I think technology has changed the uh, practice of law. Yeah. I think, now, understanding that I've spent the overwhelming 99% of my time over the last 30 plus years as a judge yeah. handling criminal stuff, right. not civil. And so, what I'm talking about may be more specific to civil to criminal than than to uh, civil cases. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but with the development of the post -conv conviction uh, relief act or po its predecessor, the post conviction hearing act, yeah. uh, the defendants seem to be uh, corresponding directly with judges more often than not than they ever used to. Uh, they bypass their attorneys, and they seem to be trying to create issues at times that I never would have anticipated huh. uh, back when uh, I first started. Right. They file pro se motions, uh, again, even when they're represented by counsel. Yeah. And recently the appellate court said, said you can't bypass counsel, that if you are represented and the, the accused send something directly to the judge. The judge's obligation is not to decide it, yes. but to send it right to the lawyer. Okay. They're getting, and invariably when they see things not going their way, they complain about uh, the, the uh, efficacy or the effectiveness of counsel. And it's always an issue. And it's made the practice of law uh, a little more difficult. Yeah. Because the defense lawyer always has to be on guard, not only by what the prosecution does and prepare for that. But by what his he own has client. to prepare about it considering his own client. Yeah. And it, it, it makes it difficult. Sure. The volume of cases makes it difficult in order to, you know, not necessarily just court appointed lawyers, but even lawyers who are privately retained. In order to make a living, you have to have the volume of cases. Mm -hmm. You know, the days of the F. Lee Baileys and the Johnny Cochran's of the world mm -hmm. who could charge six figure fees. They might go to the Enron defendants in federal court or yeah. people like that, but they're not as to the the stuff that makes up the tapestry of the everyday criminal justice system right. doesn't justify that kind of activity. Yeah. So That's it's become it, it's become more techni technological, the volume has increased, uh -huh. the severity of the crimes has increased. It, it's severity in the sense that the number of child abuse and sexual abuse cases, yeah. I think is a significantly greater uh, than anybody anticipated. And I, I sit five days a week and I will have two to three child sexual abuse cases mm -hmm. every week. And it's not because it's throughout the whole system. You know, I'm one of the judges that's been designated to hear what they call domestic violence or family violence, sexual assault cases as some judges don't don't get any of them. Yeah. But even with that caveat, the number of them is becoming staggering. I mean, the district attorney has its own unit. When I was a district attorney, they never had a family violence unit yeah. that handled only child sex ab uh, sexual abuse cases. Yeah. We have an adult defendant and a uh, minor complainant, mm. and that just was the rarity. Mm -hmm. Now it's the rule, along with the burglaries and the assaults. Yeah. You know, that's the nature of how it's changed. And the same complaint you hear on the civil side, I would say exists on the criminal side. Civility. You know, sometimes the lawyers just don't, are not civil with one another. Right. They, don't, they, don't, they, they take the adversarial routine uh, to unwarranted extremes, uh, and it makes it difficult sometimes. Sure. And 
the, the usual complaint of judges in memorial, I still complain, is that lawyers are not taught how to try a case in law school. Mm. They're taught appellate law. And that doesn't happen at my level. You're right. Okay. So examining and cross-examining witnesses or talking to a jury is, is a learned talent once you get into the practice of law. Okay. So that, that might have been the same complaint my predecessors could have had 50 years ago. Yeah. It probably was the same. Well, the, uh, several other judges who have participated in this project have also mentioned the lack of civility yeah. between uh, uh, attorneys appearing before them. And it's always it's that mindset where you always think the other side's trying to trick you. Yeah. And sometimes, uh, or there's some sort of devious motive behind everything. Every time a defense lawyer asks for a continuance, there's, there's some devious motive. And maybe sometimes there is, but it's not. It's the exception rather than the rule. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't know that if you're just an observer in the courtroom. Okay. All right. so, in a nutshell, I guess. Yeah, well, that was exactly what we were looking for. Um, I want to get into a couple of the particular cases that, that I know that you were involved in, um, if I may. And I know that one... and. And Sherry, who has worked for you, mentioned that case first, the, the Ira Einhorn case. And and you were involved in that case, and it, I know it was somewhat complicated. I thought that the, the uh, state legislature had to pass a certain Correct. law uh, that said that Ira would not be tried as, uh, or would not be a subject to the death penalty. That's correct were he to return, be extradited from France, and, and be brought here to be tried. That's correct. And I thought that was a novel uh, solution to the problem where France would not extradite a, uh, uh, somebody yeah. who had run over there, absconded to France. And, and, and uh, was already a, a convicted person, yes. Because he had been convicted? He had been, he had been tried in absentia. Right. Uh, back in the 80s, I think, in 83. Okay. All right. or, or so, and um, well, the case came up. Um, they, they they went through when it first came up, and they discovered the the body of the deceased in the trunk of the apartment, and he was eventually arrested. They had the usual procedures, including bail hearings, and uh, he made bail, and then mm -hmm. he, he skipped on the bail. Okay, and they went ahead and had the trial in absentia anyway, which is difficult because he's, you're representing an empty chair. Right, yeah. And he was convicted and they eventually found him, I guess, in the late 2000 or because eventually in 2001 he was brought back. Yeah, it wasn't that But they had ago. to do all that with the French government. They had to pass the law uh, which amended our P PCR, our Post-Conviction Relief Act statutes, okay. basically said, you know, that if someone's coming back from a state it does not have the death penalty, and they petition for a new trial, yes. you know, then, the, in so many words, the death penalty would be off the table. Right. Okay. So they, the legislature passed that, and that would that enable the extradition to actually take place and come back and have the trial. Okay. And he's now serving a life, life sentence. Okay. Yes. And what were uh, some of these other cases, uh, Judge, that came up? Um, there's an issue of freedom of religion and parental responsibility. Yeah, that was not not the type of case that comes up usually. And it involved a criminal prosecution of individuals that you would not normally define as quote unquote criminal. Yeah. They were decent citizens, but they believed in a particular religious discipline mm -hmm. that did not allow medical intervention. Uh, the faith uh, it's, I think the Faith Tabernacle or, some, or something along those lines yeah. was their, their formal name. And the way that case came into the system is that someone I deduce was neighbors uh, realized that that couple's child was very ill and alerted DHS. Uh, okay. And DHS came in and found the child at death's door. Mm -hmm. And the child was discovered to have what the, med, the doctors call a Wilms tumor. Okay. And the, the net effect of a Wilms tumor is as it grows inside of you, it basically crowds out all your other organs. Oh. So the, I don't know anything else about the etiology of it. Yeah. Uh, they had uh, relied on their religious practices when they discovered their child was ill. 
prayer and so and, yeah and they they take it to the leader of their denomination uh -huh. and they do community prayer and anointing of the six sick uh -huh. and hope for God's intervention yeah and that's how the issue um, gets raised in a criminal court mm. because you have the conflict between you're free, you have a constitutional right not only to freedom of religion but to the free exercise okay. of your religion. And that free exercise of a religion in terms of what the rest of society who is not members of that religion looks at it, which is obviously the overwhelming majority of society, yeah. looks at it as you're putting a minor child at risk. Yeah. And the minor child has no say in the matter. I see. And, and that case was tried to a jury. It was clear to the jury that the beliefs of the defendants, the husband and wife, was a sincerely held belief. It wasn't a sham or anything else like that. Mm -hmm. And they weren't trying to work some sort of scam for for welfare uh, assistance or DHS dollars or anything else like that. It was a sincerely held belief. But the issue they had to decide is if they bring up, uh, could you recognize the free exercise of religion as a defense against crimes of endangering the welfare of a child? Mm -hmm. Which was an unusual question for a jury to have. Sure. And if it was, the, it was. It's interesting if you think if the sick person was an adult, yeah. would would the same issues arise? And presumably, that you have the the freedom that if you're ill to refuse medical treatment as an adult. Yeah. But when you're talking about a minor, yeah, someone yeah. has to speak for the minors. Sure. And I, the jury convicted them. Um, they're not career criminals. I, I have not seen them in the 10 or 15 years since that case come up because yeah. I put them on probation. I didn't lock them up yeah. and uh, incarcerate them in any way. And they've never been back to court. They've completed their, their probation uh -huh. um, easily and, and without issue, never even a hint, a hint of a problem. Yeah. And the child was treated? As the, trial, well, the trial was cheated. Yeah, yeah okay. they're treated. And that, the essential point is that uh, when you're dealing with it, and that's the thing that makes it not a pure constitutional issue because you're dealing with a minor. Yeah. And someone has to speak for the minors, and you can say the system did or the jury did. Right. But that's, that's I, I thought, was the proper result in that case. Right, and then it yeah. sounds like, but yeah. a difficult issue. Yes, it is. Especially when yeah. they lay before a jury. And and uh, are, there, are there any other uh, cases that you might... Uh, that stand out in your mind? I think I have two more. Important right. issues, yeah. Santiago. Right. That was important because um, it, it was a little difficult as the judge because hmm. Santiago involved the homicide of a Philadelphia police officer. Oh, okay. And the police officer was killed in the line of duty. They arrested Santiago. And some other judge and jury tried the case. But it was given to me, I think, on remand from the appellate court Mm -hmm. to hold hearings concerning how the prosecution handled its evidence and discovery. All right. And it achieved some uh, local notoriety in its, in its day, not just because it was a police officer, but because it came on the heels of a, a case that even got greater publicity from the mid part of the state, which had to do with uh, Bradfield and Jay Smith. All right. If you remember th that case where the young woman and her children disappeared, they were never found, uh -huh. and it was uh, Jay Smith was the principal of a high school, and Bradfield was supposed to be um, the intellectual who was uh, behind the whole scheme, had to do with insurance money. They never did find the body right. of the woman or her children, uh, but they were able to successfully prosecute the cases anyway. Bradfield's doing his time, and Smith is doing his time. And they, the appellate courts made some rulings on the Smith case concerning how uh, the discovery and gathering of evidence was handled during the progress, the life of the case. Uh -huh. And it, that decision bore upon my decision. And in, I'll never forget the day, and I, I don't blame anyone for this. It's something I would have done in their shoes, but they used one of the large ceremonial courtrooms here in City Hall. Yeah. and. The question was, um, on these post-verdict motions, as they were called then, whether <clears throat> if I find that the, the 
government had made mistakes, what do I do? Do I allow them to appeal the issue? Do I grant a new trial? Do I discharge it? Um, because of prosecutorial misconduct. Yeah. Remember that the J. Smith case resulted in the case being discharged because of the mishandling of evidence. So they knew that was the issue. And when I walked out in the courtroom, and it's, if you're familiar with the 600 series courtrooms, yes. they're big. Yes. And it's entirely lined with Philadelphia police officers. Uh. <laughs> yeah, and as, you know, there's defense lawyers. The defendant didn't have much of a following. 653 and, and, is one of those yes, huge rooms up there. Prosecutors, yeah. and uh, I made the decision that the prosecutorial misconduct had risen to such a level that the case should be discharged following what I thought the ruling in Smith was, mm. which obviously didn't go over too well with the uh, <laughs> no. uh, district it's attorney's fabulous. office or the police force. Right. I must say the Superior Court did not agree with me and I was reversed, mm. but it was significant in its time Yeah, for that sure reason. Was. yeah. Is that the case that Peter Bowers was involved in as a defense attorney? I don't think so. Maybe it was later or something. Okay. And then I have another case listed here about constitutional rights, Fifth Amendment, Commonwealth versus Ball and yeah, Kavanaugh. Yeah, that's, that's more of a, a technical thing because you don't see this. But that involved an arson case, uh -huh. and the defendants owned a company. They had an insurance policy. Their building burnt. They were eventually charged with arson. Arson. Yeah. And there was two investigations going on at the same time. There was the criminal investigation, and there was the investigation by the insurance company oh, right. and their lawyers yeah. relevant to the payment of a uh, casualty claim. Yeah. And. The constitutional issue I found rose in that case because the insurance company attorneys did things to get evidence from the defendants that the police would not be allowed to do. Okay. And I found that there was a uh, relationship between the insurance company attorneys okay. and the fire department, fire marshal's office, police department um, that was more than it should have been. Okay. And so, if you talk in constitutional law terms, yes. in order for ha to have a constitutional issue with the reception of evidence, be it a s confession or physical evidence of some type, yeah. there has to be state action because the it's not what civilians do that is prohibited by the Fourth, Act, the Fourth Amendment, it's what government does. Right. So government can't invade your person, places, and private things without a warrant or without probable cause, etc. <clears throat> civilians can. Yes. Without constitutional problems, they might have other problems like trespassing or burglary, but not constitutional problems that would cause the evidence to be tossed out of court. Like the agents of the insurance company. Yes, well, that's what. And now the agents of the insurance companies, they can have take depositions, and they can tell, which is what they did in this case, and tell the accused either answer our questions. If you don't answer our questions, then we're going to deny your claim. Mm -hmm. So they had no choice but to answer the questions. So they answered the questions, and. Some of the answers they give uh, <clears throat> could harm them in the criminal case. Okay. And right after, <clears throat> so to speak, right after the deposition was finished, as soon as they got the, the insurance lawyers got a copy of it, they gave it to the, the, the police. And there was more of a relationship to that, but basically what I what came down to is that, as I said, it has to be state action, it has to be the government. Yes. But sometimes you can find that the state agency, the government is using civilians okay. and giving them the evidence on a silver platter, trying to do indirectly what they cannot do directly. Right. And that's what I found in that okay. case. Okay. Which that's was of interest, I guess, technically, it wouldn't go put in the headlines in the daily news well, like, the, no. like the police officer shooting or, the, or Einhorn would. Right, yeah. no, but it was still interesting nonetheless. Um, now, uh, you mentioned about uh, the seemingly a decline of civility in the courtroom. and uh, Suppose... Not so much in the courtroom no. vis-a-vis -vis the lawyers and the judge. Okay. But about between the lawyers. Right. You better have been around long enough. And even if it's... They don't do anything obvious in the courtroom, you can sense it when there's a tension between them. Or they don't get along. They yeah. can't work things out. Yeah. Automatically, yeah, you, you can sense. I can, yeah. I can sense it. I don't know about it. Yeah. And in most of the case, sometimes I can't, but most of the time I can. And the frequency of that has increased. Okay. But as far as when they turn around and have to face me, 
uh, then the instances of lawyers being uncivil to the court is few and far between. Okay, yeah. good. All right, that was a good point yeah. to clarify. Uh, in, in cases where uh, uh, some a lawyer today would, might want to become a judge, what would be your most important advice to them? <laughs> Before you become a judge, get as much experience as you can. Okay. Not only in the practice of law, but in the conduct of life. You have to, be, you have to understand that uh, the people that are going to wind up in a criminal court and don't always come from the same area. Mm -hmm. there's, there's unwritten rules that are sometimes different. And then you can go to Ardmore in the main line or Northeast Philadelphia, mm -hmm. uh, to certain sections of Northeast Philadelphia, big single home areas. And what is accepted, not accepted, how things are usually done up there is a lot different than in some depressed area. Right. or some area where most of the people are below the poverty level. They have different rules. And you have to learn as a judge that those people are not necessarily who come in who might have different rules from when you grew up. Yeah. They are not necessarily being insincere, but that's what they know. That's what their environment has taught them. Okay. So some kid who lives in a depressed area doesn't go to school because he sees the guy down at the corner selling coke who's walking around with a wad of hundreds in his pocket yeah. and has got a color TV and a, a, a shiny new car at his house, and he didn't go to school either. Yeah. It's much more attractive than laboring for the uh, minimum wages through high school and college. Yes. Uh, it's, it's, and uh, <clears throat> how you solve problems with, with the, at the risk of sounding too ethnic the rules that we apply in courts are, for the most part, written by white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Yeah. And you have to realize that. And those white Anglo-Saxon Protestants don't acknowledge some of the rules that you think might govern in your neighborhood. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. you have to learn the difference. And as a judge, you have to be able to recognize that somebody is operating under a different set of rules. Right. And why that can't dictate your final judgment it tempers it so you understand it. Sure. So an understanding of the human condition is something that you really have to uh, pay attention to, be observant. I just, if a new judge asks me for advice, yeah. uh, so there's enough judges around to teach you uh, procedure and protocols. And that. So after you've been on the bench for a, while, for a while, when you have a chance, get off the bench, go out and sit in your own courtroom and look at the bench and see yourself as the other people see you. It grounds you sometimes. Uh -huh. And my advice to people becoming judges would be more along those lines in terms of the temperament and how they view and what, besides the necessary technical trial yeah. legal experience that they need, they have to have uh, become a good observer and understanding of the human condition to understand the people in front of them mm -hmm. because they come from all different walks of life, have all different backgrounds, all different levels of education. Right. And so they may perceive and react differently than someone uh, similar to myself. Yeah. You know, I got three, went to high school, college, graduate school, law school, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. I have a different perspective, right. a different background. But as a judge, since the other people from m yeah. many different backgrounds are coming before you, in order to render a fair decision, you have to try as hard as you can to understand the position that yeah. they're coming from. Doesn't excuse yeah. a crime. No. But you, you can understand if someone reacts in assault, an assaultive way to a certain uh, situation that I would have reacted in a different way. Right. Uh, I doesn't excuse their, their conduct. Mm -hmm. But at least it gives you an understanding of it when you, when you have to deal with it in terms of the verdict, uh, what you believe the evidence showed in terms of state of mind, uh -huh. and if the person is adjudicated guilty, uh, how to fashion the proper sentence. Right. And that, that yeah, yeah. I think, would be extremely important, maybe more important yes, than right. a lot of other things. Yeah, it's different because it's, it's easy just to sit there and give everyone the maximum sentence. Yeah. Or, or something like that, or just follow the guidelines, but you have to... Uh, put something into it that's a little different. Yeah. Um, I, that's what I would ask him to try and 
get as much information about mm -hmm. before they become a judge. Mm -hmm. The other stuff, they'll let the law professors take deal yeah. with them. But that was that's good advice, I think. Is there anything else that you might want to talk about today, or do you have any other? I noticed in some of the paperwork they gave me when they set up the interview. Yeah. One of the questions was one of the proudest moments as a judge. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, and it, but it's difficult. It's difficult, especially when you consider I've been sitting in a criminal court. Oh, right. Yeah, and that's one area. The second area is you have to understand the difference between the judging business and the business of judging. Mm -hmm. Now, the judging business is all the paperwork I have to do. I have to write opinions. I have to fill out forms and all that type of thing. Yeah. And the business of judging is what we have been talking about. It's what I do when I get on the bench in the courtroom yeah. in um, analyzing witnesses or evaluating witnesses for credibility and listening to arguments of, of attorneys for one side or the other or actually rendering a verdict in, in non-jury cases. Uh -huh. That's the, the business of judging. And in the criminal courts, in the, excuse me, the judging business, there is no winners. As you could have in, you, in, this, in any sense. It's likewise in civil cases, uh, like personal injury cases, you know, someone is found to be liable or not to be liable, so in a sense there's winners and losers. Yeah. But in, in commerce court and things like that, and if there's a settlement reached, but in criminal cases, there's always a sharp line between the winner and loser. Mm -hmm. um, the, the complainant is the winner if the accused is found guilty, right. or the defendant is a winner if uh, he's found not guilty. Yeah. I mean, that's not accurate. That's not what justice in a courtroom is about. Uh, but occasionally, uh, I've had it where I have jurors after a trial or complainants. and. This comes to mind because recently I sentenced somebody after a jury verdict on serious cases and the complainants, young ladies, mm. uh, came into court and said their piece at the sentencing hearing and wrote me letters afterwards uh, complimenting me on how I handled their testimony at trial and as they, you know, I, I gave them the impression that when they were talking yeah. At sentencing, I was really interested in what they had to say. Oh. And those are letters you save. Yeah. Yeah. It no, doesn't happen every once in a while. Maybe eight or ten years ago, I was at a function and a lady came up to me who was the mother of a defendant, and because I fashioned a sentence in a certain way, yeah. she said I had a, a long-term effect on her son's life and it came out for the better. Oh, good. Now, I might sentence thousands of defendants over the last 30 sure, years. Sure, yeah. I only get one or two, but that's, that's yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah. One or two is enough. I was, uh, we were talking about people coming from different areas and being under different sets of rules, and I used to be a probation officer okay. in, out in West Philly with juveniles, though, and very few of the kids ever came back to say hi, but yeah. two or three came back to say thank you. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. good. Yeah. That makes your day. <laughs> yeah, with, with all the, with with all the negative side of society that I hear by and see by definition by sitting in criminal court, mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah. good when you see something like that once in a while. Yeah, the, the positive aspect. And and you know, even, yeah. even after thirty some years, <laughs> I'm doing this. Good for you. Yeah. Well, I thank you very much, Judge. My pleasure. Soul. I appreciate. I hope I didn't talk too much. No, no, no. Okay. You didn't. Uh, if you'd like to talk on, we can stay I, here forever. I, I, I know. Want.